John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. I'll read the odd-numbered verses on my own. You join me on the even-numbered verses in the last verse, verse 17, please. Seventeen. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jews went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Uh, having five porches. Um, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, Is it law? I'm sorry, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done those things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And now let's pray. Father, please empower preacher as he brings the word of God and help us to be attentive and help us to be soft-hearted to submit to whatever you teach us at this time now. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eyes on And I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender word I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, 
His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to Him. From care He sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know watches me his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eye me. Thank you, Brother Gibbons. I love music that's based off of scripture and the fact that that whole song talks about if God cares about the sparrows, how much more does he care about us? And I love, love scripture like that. Oh, you got your Bibles open to John chapter 5 this morning. John chapter 5 is where we're going to be at. Um, This is not an unfamiliar passage of scripture. If you've been to any church services or uh, been in church, grown up in church, I'm sure you've heard many or plenty of messages preached off of the impotent man, the healing of the impotent man. And this is not even the first time that I preached a message on this, but I believe it'll be a help to you, something that stood out to me. Um, and this, this passage that kind of bothered me a little bit. And I don't mean bother me, meaning the way it's been written, but bothered me in this man's case. And uh, the text passage or the portion of the scripture that I'm going to use today is, is verses 5 through 9. I gave you verses 1 through 17 this morning to put everything in context. Uh, but we have this, this opportunity uh, that comes around on occasion. The Bible doesn't say how often that this pool at Bethesda was, was uh, 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 troubled. But on occasion, this pool at Bethesda was troubled by an angel. And uh, there, at that time of the troubling, an individual, the first one into the pool, would have a miraculous healing. Whatever that they were dealing with, whether it was a disease or whether it be a, a uh, and in this man's case, uh, he's lame, you know, he's never been able to walk since the time of being a, you know, probably a child or maybe an accident caused it. Whoever was to get into that water first, this miracle, you know, caused by the angel touching the water would cause them to be made whole. And there is a lot of people there. You know, this is not a massive pool, but it's a, a pool that's large enough to where there's enough people to be able to surround it around it. And Jesus, of course, is coming through this area, and he sees this crowd, and there just happens to be a man that's there closest to him. And, you know, Jesus, being God, understands, hey, I understand this man's situation. And he asks the man a very pointed question. You know, he, he goes into uh, uh, verse number 5. He says, and a certain man was there, look at verse number 5 with me, which had an infirmity 38 years 38 years he's lame. That's a long time to not be able to walk, whether caused by an accident or whether caused by birth. If he's 38 years old and let's say from the time of his birth he hasn't walked, that's a long time. And Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case and saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? You know, one of the things I love about Jesus' teaching is he often asks questions. 
you know, and I'd like to think that this man, uh, you know, looking at him, you know, at, at first is thinking, that's kind of a funny question to ask. Yet, the impotent man answered him after hearing this question asked, and this is where I found it to be sad. It says, Sir, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step it down before me, and, 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 and uh, another man step it down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. You know, I, I read this passage again this week, and in his answer to Jesus of saying, I, I have no man. The title of the message this morning is, No man to help me. No man to help me. What I want to do this morning is I want to take this passage, these verses, verses 5 through 9, and I want to apply it to us in our case of one being just like this impotent man, of needing help, but at the same time of maybe being an individual that can help someone else in their case. So my question this morning for the whole premise of the message is this, will you help? Will you help? You know, so let me give you these five things this morning. I don't have a long introduction this morning, so I want to get right into the points and use the time wisely. But take your Bibles with me and turn to Mark chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there is a pew Bible there for you to use. You just ask that you put it back after you're done using it so that someone else can use it next time that they're here. Uh, But if you don't have one, that's there for you to be able to be used. I I want you to uh, uh, be able to see these scriptures. We we believe in using the Bible because God's given it to us for that purpose. It's not a book to be uh, sat on a shelf and collect dust. God wants us to read it. God wants us to get understanding from it. It's what he uses to speak to us. One of the ways he uses to speak to us. You know, so five things this morning that relate to us in the lame, lame man. Number one, as you're turning to Mark chapter 6, verse 34, I'm going to reference back to verse number 5 of, uh, of John chapter 5. The Bible says this, And a certain man that was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Number one, we see this man's distress. We see this man's distress. That word distress means extreme pain, uh, anguish of body or mind, affliction, calamity, or misery. You know, so in, in looking at this story, you know, it's, it's not hard for any of us to understand what type of condition this man is in. You know, I, I visit uh, uh, nursing homes and I, I visit individuals that are in our church that are now what we call shut-ins. They're not able to get out because of their physical condition. You know, and in talking to many of them, seeing their physical condition, you can see their pain. You can see their anguish, their distress that is there in their life that they're dealing with. I think about Mr. Jacobs. Uh, who just passed away recently, and, you know, he's one of the few exceptions of individuals I've talked to that would never, ever complain about his condition. You know, the, the extreme arthritis condition that he had that caused his hands and, and, and his feet and his bones to be, to be uh, crippled and, and con- contorted and, and uh, the pain that he was in, yet I never heard him complain one time. You could see the pain that he was in, but he never complained about it. You know, we see individuals, we all know, I guarantee you right now, you can think of someone that you know, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, maybe an acquaintance, maybe someone you've seen that has gone through distress, maybe something that has caused them extreme pain, not just physically, but mentally. You got to think, you know, uh, sitting there, uh, this man, just trying to put it in perspective, if you're this man that's been, in, been crippled for 38 years, and every time he sees this water troubled, Every single time you see it in trouble, he tries to make his way over there as quickly as he can. Yet, the Bible tells us, he, in his case of answering Jesus, someone else got there before him. That's got to be dis- discouraging, depressing, the mental anguish, the physical anguish, the distress that he's in. And you say, well, how does that apply to me? You know, I may be here today and I may not have crippling effects. I, uh, right now, my mind is, you know, seems to be in, in a good state of, uh, of being positive. I can't think of anything negative right now. That would cause me to uh, be in a state of distress. You know, how does this apply to me? Well, I look at this world that we live in, and it's distress. Just like this lame man. Not just physically in some cases, but spiritually in all cases. You know, we have a, a problem in, in our world. This problem goes all the way back to the beginning of time. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. It goes all the way back to the one command that God gave to them not to do. You know, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Started this process of distress. It wasn't just the process of physical death. 
Because as we know, uh, sin passed upon all man. Man has died from that point on, physically. But it was a spiritual death. You know, a, a, phys a, a spiritual separation between them and God. You know, a distress that caused man to, to have a, a, a needing desire to fill a hole in their life that even to this day people are still trying to fill because they're not filling it with the right things. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. You know what happens with sheep that have no shepherd? What do they do? They go astray. They wander. You know, they end up getting lost. You know, you see this in the case of, uh, uh, of David as a shepherd in, in the Old Testament. And, and, or sorry, not David, Moses. You know, in the Old Testament where God uses a wandering sheep to get a hold of Moses' attention. It was not uncommon if you, as a shepherd, have a flock and maybe one or two, you know, have their own idea of what they're going to do and they wander off. Whether it be food or whether it be a distraction, you know, uh, it, it caused them to get off track. You know, in our society, there are so many distractions, so many things that people are, are groping after to fill a, an emptiness that is inside that they can't fill with anything else other than Jesus Christ. You know, I worked with addicts for two and a half years, as many of you, as many of you know, and, and uh, I'd often ask the, the, the individuals that were there at this program that I was a part of, this faith-based faith -based addictions program, I said, hey, I go, uh, you know, how did it work out for you in trying to fill that, that addiction with A, B, C, D, whatever the case may be, whatever it is, and they said, well, I wouldn't be here if it was, was for the fact that I've, I'd gotten it fixed. You know, I heard a preacher say one time, you know, you've got a Jesus shape or a God shaped hole in your heart. And the only thing that's going to fill that hole is Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to give you victory in your life is Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to take care of that distress is Jesus Christ. Isaiah 59 verse 2, the Bible says, but your iniquities, your wrongdoings, your sin have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We have a problem, a distress in our life. That sin has separated us from God, caused us to be spiritually distressed. You know, spiritually wanting, spiritually needing. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all of sin. That's going back to Adam, that one man. One man sin entered into the world, and death has passed upon all men, so that all are sinners. All are sinners. We've got a problem. You know, as we look around at the world around us, no doubt we see countless numbers of people that are crippled by sin. They're in a hopeless condition. No matter how hard they try, they cannot get to God in their own strength. They're helpless just as this man was. They can't pray. They can't worship. They can't serve God properly. They can't enjoy the good things of God. How terrible to be in this distress that sin has caused. Our sin has separated us from God. You know, the very first thing that we need to understand when it comes down to our condition is that every single one of us are sinners. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. No, not one. Each and every one of us has a, a crippling effect of sin in our lives. We're all, in some cases, and maybe some point in our life, distressed just like this man was hey but there's hope this morning you know just like this man you know needing a hope just like this man needing a healing you know there is one that can help you to deal with that distress and it, and it is it, you know you know what the the uh uh what, what do you call it? the um the uh, resolution to your distress is not in a pill you know it's not in a a uh uh, it, it's, it's not in a self-motivational helps thing, you know what, because, you know, we can't take care of the problem on our own. If we could, we'd be done. We wouldn't have to worry about it. We wouldn't need God. You know, so number one, you know, his, his distress. Sin has caused us to be distressed spiritually. Number two, his desire. His desire. I want you to turn to one pass here. I'm going to mention a couple different ones here, but turn to Acts chapter 16. I love the book of Acts because this talks about the early church. The early church has a lot of good illustrations to us of individuals that were able to receive Christ, you know, were able to be reached uh, by those that were followers of Christ for, for Jesus' sake. You know, I, but I do want to see, I want you to see a couple of these here. Number, number two, 
not only does this, this man distress, the, how do we relate to the lame man? His distress. We're distressed by sin, just like the man was distressed by his, his uh, uh, lameness, his crippling, uh, the condition that he was in. Number two, his desire. Number, verse number five, we see his desire. You'd say, well, how do we know that this man desired to be healed? He was by the pool of Bethesda. You know, if he didn't desire to be healed, he wouldn't have bothered to be there. And we know that he had come often because the Bible tells us in his response from uh, his, his conversation with Jesus, his answer to Jesus, you know, hey, I, you know, I, I, when the tool is troubled, I make my way there and someone would get ahead of me. They'd get there first. It doesn't say how long or how often he was there, but we know he went often. He had a desire to be healed. You know, we, de we see the desire of this man's heart is for healing. And the desire in the heart of mankind, spiritually, is for heaven. You know, every individual desires for something better after this life. You know, I, I know that life is hard. I've seen it. I've experienced some of it. Can't, ex can't say I've experienced all of it. You know, many of us could see it. Many of us have experienced differences in, in life. And, and man's desire is for hopes that after this life, that there's something better. That there's something that uh, would give us peace. A desire to have that distress taken away for good that we go through. The Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 verse 30 is where I want you to look at, at verse number 30. It says, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Of course, Paul is, is in prison here with another companion of his. And, and uh, they're in prison wrongfully in prison for, for things that they had not done any, had not done anything wrong. Of course, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day had problems with them because they didn't like the fact that they were turning the world upside down. They were basically making the religious leaders of the day look like fools because they didn't know the very scripture they should have known. And, and Paul and, and, and uh, uh, his companion are in jail, and at that time, they're just in jail singing songs, singing praises unto God. And during this time, God creates a miracle. An earthquake happens. And it causes all the shackles to fall off every prisoner that are there. Cause all the, all the doors to be open. And of course, you know, if you understand Roman law, those that are in charge of those individuals, if any of them escape, the individual who's in charge of them, it's punishable by death. And it's not just any death. It's not just they bring you in and say, okay, we're just going to lop your head off. No, they torture you to death by Roman law. You know, so we can understand that this Philippian jailer, after everything that's just happened, this earthquake happens, you know, you know, he, he wakes up from whatever is going on. He's probably just relaxing there, maybe even sleeping, and, you know, wakes up in a panic. He sees the doors that are open, and he's thinking, hey, it's a jailbreak. Everybody's gone. And he gets fearful for his own life, and he's about ready to take his own life for fear of the fact of being put to tortured death. It'd be better for him just to take his life, he's thinking. And Paul says, hey, hold on a minute. He goes, everybody's here, no one's left, you know, don't, don't take your life. And the Bible tells us he comes in trembling before, the, before Paul and his commandment, uh, companion there, and, and, he, and he brings them out and he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, he has an understanding, hey, I desire to have what you have. I desire to have that peace that you're singing about. That understanding that there is something better after this life. You know, I, I think about another passage, the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You know, it, it, we, it, what's significant about this is Jesus waits by this well. He, he sends his disciples into town to get food, and, and he knew Jesus being God, he understood that this woman was going to be there. It wasn't a surprise to him that this woman was going to be there. And he strikes up a conversation with her. And he's talking to her, and he reveals some things to her that I think were a surprise to her. How could you know these things about me having, you know, five husbands or four husbands, and the one I currently have is not the one that is, I'm not married to? And he talks about the fact of this drawing of water, and he refers to a water, an eternal water, if you will, an eternal life, if you will, that, that uh, would cause an individual to never have to thirst no more. And this, this woman looks at it and says, I, I, you know, what is this water? Hey, I, I want this water. You know, I don't want to have to thirst again, spiritually speaking. And Jesus Christ reveals to her you know, the fact that he is that one that has come 
to die for the sins of mankind so that heaven could be made available to those that wanted it. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, I want you to turn to, to Acts chapter 8. This will be the last one I have you turn to for point two. Acts chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 30 and 31. And I'm actually going to read a couple other verses along with this. Acts chapter 8. Probably one of my favorite, favorite passages of Scripture when it comes to someone being led to Christ. Someone coming under the understanding of, of uh, who salvation is through and how it's obtained. Acts chapter 8, looking at verses 30 and 31. So to kind of, before we read that, kind of give you an understanding here, Philip is told by God, by the Holy Spirit, to go down to Gaza, which is desert. It's a very desert place. And, of course, the Holy Spirit doesn't tell him why to go down, but as he's going down there, uh, he comes across an Ethiopian eunuch. He is in charge. He's the treasurer. He's in charge of all the, the finances of the queen of Ethiopia, Candace of Ethiopia. And he sees him here, and he, he's coming back from Jerusalem from a time of worship, and he's reading the scriptures out of the book of Isaiah. And, of course, Philip joins himself to this chariot, and he sees this, and he says, Hey, understand this, what thou readest. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you see what you're reading? Do you understand what the Bible in this passage is talking about? And I think it was Isaiah 53, if I remember correctly, where a lamb uh, uh, being led, uh, dumb to slaughter, meaning not speaking up for himself, just being led to slaughter. And he says, how can I understand this unless someone show me? He goes, is this talking about the prophet? Is it talking about someone else? I, I don't understand. And of course, Philip takes that passage and he preaches unto him Christ. He explains to him this is an Old Testament prophecy of the coming Messiah, Jesus. And we get down to verse number 30. And, and, 31 is, and, and it, or verse number 30 and 31 gives this, and I'll give you that in verse 36. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And desired Philip, he would come up and sit with him. You know, before I read verse 36 and give you the rest of this, you know, I find a lot, I knock a lot of doors and I talk to a lot of people. There is a lot of individuals that are in our society, in our communities even, that have a desire to know God, have a desire to know the Bible. They just don't have someone to help guide them. They don't have someone to help them to understand. Just like this Ethiopian eunuch needed understanding. You know, in verse 36, the Bible tells us, and they went on their way, and they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You know, so we see here a desire from the Ethiopian eunuch to to, to get closer to God in a way. He obviously understood that baptism was significant. And in most modern versions of the Bible, the next verse is removed. I want you to look at, at verse, uh, verse number 37 in Acts chapter 8. Verse number 37 in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says this, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know, he explained to him, hey, you know, my, his desire was to understand the passage. His desire was to be able to have that salvation that was, was available to him. And he even had a desire to take a step towards Christ in that way of baptism, but he understood there was something that was missing. What is hindering me from getting baptized? After you've shared all this with me, what is it that's hindering me? He says, well, if you believe everything I just showed you, if you believe that Jesus Christ really is who he said he was, then you can get baptized. Then you can get baptized. It wasn't the baptism that got him saved. Baptism was just a representation of the decision he was making. It's a wedding band, if you will. You know, it showed others, hey, I believe in the individual that I put it in. That, that baptism it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, it's an a illustration of what Christ did for us on the cross. He had a desire, a desire that was there, a, a man's heart that desired to do God's will. You know, I, I think of another, and this story is not so much a very happy story, but the rich young man in Matthew chapter 19, and verse 16, there was a rich young man that came to Jesus Christ, and he said, and, and the passage reads this, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus Christ, of course, explains to him what he needs to do, and, and Jesus Christ, knowing his heart, knew that there was something in the way of him receiving that salvation. It was his wealth. 
He wasn't willing to, to give up, if you will, that wealth. It was in the way of him receiving Christ. And the young man, not being willing to give up that, walks away sorrowful because it was too hard for him to give up what Christ was asking. It wasn't Christ saying, hey, you need to give up your wealth in order to be saved. Christ brought that up to help him understand there's something in the way of you actually receiving me fully. That wealth you're holding on to is more important to you than I am important to you. You know, man's desires for help is de dependent on whether they are willing to submit to that help being given or only accept the certain help that we see as best. You know, we have a desire to get close to a God that, uh, that we call our God. Jesus Christ is that individual that we should desire to be close to, just like this man found out, hey, there is one that can heal. This man, Jesus Christ, was, was the one that healed this lame man, just like he can help us with our salvation, just like he can help heal us if he sees fit to do so. Number three, number three, turn to Psalms chapter 142. Psalms 142. A few more points. We're almost done this morning. We see this man's uh, distress. We see this man's desire. Just like we're distressed, just like we have desire to be close to God, just like we have a desire to have uh, heaven someday and, and be able to obtain it. Number three, we see his difficulty. We see his difficulty. In verse number seven of the passage that we read this morning, uh, the Bible tells us the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step it down before me. We see his difficulty. He had a hard time getting down to the pool. He was lame. You know, he couldn't get there quick enough. You know, I'm sure that there were others there that might have had leprosy. Maybe uh, uh, there were there, uh, others there that, you know, maybe had other diseases, maybe blood disease, whatever the case may be, had a little bit of av better availability to get down to the pool. Yet this man couldn't. He had difficulty getting there. You know, if desire was enough to be healed, then this man would have been healed. Jesus, at the, at, at, as the world's desire, is not enough to get them to heaven or to have a relationship with God. This world is crying. Sorry, Jesus, Jesus is the world's, is the only desire that we should have. You know, when it comes down to being enough, you know, for heaven and a relationship with God. This world is crying out for help. And some just walk on by. You know, I often, I, I, I observe, you know, I think I probably learned this from you, Dad. You know, I, I, I often observe, you know, people. I, I like to watch people. You know, and one of the, and, I, and not in a creepy way, don't, don't, I like to watch how people interact. You know, I like to see how they interact with one another. You know, when I was an assistant pastor in Colorado, often there was at any time 30% of the population um, in, in Longmont, uh, uh, you know, I had, uh, you know, a population of about 300 plus uh, uh, homeless people in it. You know, 30% of an area had about 300. There was a lot, a lot of homeless people in, in Longmont. And often I'd watch how people would interact with them. You know, and, and if, uh, Ken, if I could use you for a minute, if you can come up here for a sec, I'll use you like this. Let's say that Ken is homeless. Now, Ken is not. Praise God, he's not. You know, let's say Ken is homeless. You know, a lot of times you see individuals, even, at, okay, at our Walmart down here in Brunswick, I see it often. Individuals standing there need help, don't have food. You know, will work for food in some cases. And, and those individuals will be standing there asking, have a hand, I, I need help. And you, you'll be, you know, if I'm the one that's walking by, oftentimes we just, you know, we, you sit at the, I see it at the intersection. You know, if Ken's standing there with a the sign and I'm sitting here in my car, you know, you see individuals that they won't even look them in the eye. They try to avoid them. Thank you. You know, I, you know one, of the, one of the things that I see often in society is those that are down and out that need it the most. Most people just pass on by. Oh, someone else will do it. I don't need to do it. I, I don't have the means to. And I understand that we can't help everybody. I understand that there's going to be times where we're going to be limited, but there is one area that everybody can be helped, spiritually speaking. In order for those that have a desire to want to be with God someday, you can give them the gospel. Ba greatest hope to any man is to be, able to, have, to be able to go to heaven someday. You know, yeah, so many people we walk by, oh, well, no, someone else will talk to him about the gospel. Someone else will give it to him. I know it's man's fear. I, you know, can I be honest with you? You know, be uh, candid with you this morning? You know, I'd be the first one to raise my hand and say, you know, I don't always like talking to the individuals I talk to. 
you know, I knock on a door and, you know, a big burly guy comes to the door, tattoos up his arm. I mean, it looks like he could take my head and squash it like a grape. I'm like, uh-uh, you know, it's starting to, uh, uh, you know, I'm a local pet. You know, I, I'm thinking, man, this guy's going to pummel me. He's, you, know, you know, usually some of those most soft-hearted individuals, the individuals we look at and on the outside we judge them quickly because, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk to that individual. You know, they're a little rough around the edges. They don't, they're not going to listen. Yet most of the time they are willing to listen. They are looking for help. You know, they are looking for a, a uh, uh, solution to their problems. Look at Psalms 142, verse 4. I look on my right hand, and behold, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. This is a Psalm of David. David's in a distress in his life. David's in a distress so much so, he says, I looked for help, and there was no one there to comfort me. He goes, there was no one that cared. They looked at me, and they just passed on by. You know how often in our society that is the case. It doesn't matter who it is. You know, I think every single one of us in here has been guilty of that at times. I'd be willing to admit that. You know, there are lots that are reaching out for help, yet do we care? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24, Because I have called, and you refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. Again, Proverbs is written by David's son Solomon, and, and uh, of course, in the wisdom that, uh, th that God gave him, another distress of his time. Hey, I, I called, no man regarded, no one cared, no one wanted to deal with it. They just passed on by. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, How then shall we call on him, and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That word preacher is not talking about a pastor. That word preacher, if you look at the definition, means one who proclaims, one who speaks up. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, Romans chapter 10 talks about the, the individuals, you know, and all throughout Romans, Paul writes about the fact of people needing salvation. He says, but how can they understand salvation when they don't have someone to tell them? If they don't hear it, if they don't, they don't, they don't receive it, how are they supposed to receive it if they don't have someone to tell them? You know, there are individuals out there, and you heard of our two times that we go out visiting. You know, we go out knocking on doors, not just to give an invitation to church to help people understand, hey, there's a church in the area that cares about you, that, that uh, uh, you can be a part of. But on the back of this little pamphlet here is the plan of salvation. We call it the Romans Road. Uh, you can call it the Bible Way to Heaven, whatever you want to call it. You know, but it gives five, uh, or five, five truths, five simple truths to help an individual understand, number one, God loves you. God loves you. He doesn't hate you. God loves you. And because he loves you, you know, God wants to provide something for you because of your condition, number two. Number two, we're all sinners. Every single one of us ends up as, as sin in our life. And because of that sin, number three, it separates us from God. We all deserve to go to a place called hell. I don't like the thought of a hell. I, 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 can I human, human side of me? You know, I hate the fact that the Bible talks about hell doesn't mean that it's not there. doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. You know, God was loving enough to tell us about it because he doesn't want us to go there. You know, God tells us uh, he loves us so much that, number four, he was willing to die for us. Probably one of the most famous verses in all the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants you to be able to go to heaven someday. He provided it through Jesus Christ because our sins separated us from him. And the last truth is the fact that all it takes is you being willing to ask him. Being willing to put that little bit of faith that you have that Jesus Christ really was who he said he was. You know, history proves that Jesus Christ was a real person. They can't disprove that. You know, but where faith steps in is, was he really Christ? I wasn't there. You weren't there. It takes just as much faith to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God as it does to believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. How many of you were around when George Washington was the president? <laughs> None of us. Now, if you are, I'd like to know your secret for life, lifelong living, you know, for all these years. You know, but none of us have been around since George Washington. Just because a book says it doesn't mean it's true. It takes that faith. It takes that faith to put it in and say, you know what, I believe that is the truth. 
I believe that is the case. The difficulty this man faced was that no man would help him into the pool. The difficulty this world faces is that very few will help them to the Savior. Very few will give out a track. You know, it doesn't take much. Hey, you know, I wanted to give this to you. Get, get, you can read it when you get the chance. That's it. If they say no, that's okay. You gave them an opportunity. It's not your job to convince them. It's God's job to convince them. But you did your job in trying to tell them. Hey, it may be that you have someone that you can invite to church. Hey, you know what? What are you doing on Sunday? You know, I go to church. You know, would you like to come to church with me on Sunday? You know, where maybe someone could get to them and show them from the Bible about going to heaven. Maybe you can learn. Hey, you know what? I started as a teenager when I didn't really know the gospel that well, taking tracks like these and going through it, showing people. I didn't know it that well, but I knew it well enough to understand where I put my trust in. You know, the world needs help spiritually. You know, the hope for our, our, our nation, America, is not in the government. I'm sorry. I don't care who the president is. You know, I, it doesn't matter who the president is. The hope for this world is not in the government. The only hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. He's the only, it's got to change the heart. It's a heart issue. That's what it is. It's not a gun issue. It's a heart issue. It's not a, 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 a uh, you know, fill in the blank, whatever, you know, all the excuses we're using for what the issues are. It's a heart issue. You know, it's man's heart that's the problem. And, we, and the man, uh, uh, the world needs someone to go to them and explain to them, hey, Jesus is the answer. He is the one that can give you victory. He is the one that can change you. Number four. The lamb man tells Jesus his plight, his disappointment. You know, the thing that bothered me about this passage the most in my spirit is the fact that you see the disappointment in this man. I have no man. No one cared. No man cares about me to help me. No man was bothered by the fact that I can't get down to the pool to get healed. His disappointment. You know, the lame man tells Jesus his plight of always being beat to the pool by another. You know, people try everything they can to reach heaven, only to wind up disappointed. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, there are those out there that think their good works are going to get them to heaven. Going back to what the Bible says, the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. And if there is none righteous, no, not one, then it means each and every one of us has this problem of sin. And that sin separates us from God. And that's a problem because now, in our own flesh, we can't get to heaven on our own. The Bible tells us the only way to heaven, the only way we're saved is through our faith, through, that, through Jesus Christ who died for us. It is not in works. Very clearly, verse number, number 9 says, not of works lest any man should boast. There are those in the world saying, ah, I'm a good enough person. You know how often I, I meet people? And again, I don't, I understand. I understand where they're coming from. I've never murdered anybody. Well, thank God for that. You know, I'm glad you've never murdered anybody. You know, praise God for that. I go, but, you know, you know have you ever lied? Have you ever stole? Have you ever cheated? Have you, ever, you know, you can go down the laundry list of things that the Bible talks about as being sins. Every single one of us has done at least one, one thing wrong. At least one. And if we're really honest, we've done a lot. You know, if I were to stand up, you know, this makes it perfect for the illustration. If I were to stand up here today and tell you I've never lied. My dad and my mom are here. They could probably attest to the fact that, oh yeah, he's lied. <laughs> you know, I'd be lying straight up. You know, we all have messed up. You know, and, and the world's disappointment is that no matter how hard we try to get to heaven on our own, it's not enough. That's why we needed Jesus Christ. Hey, if we could get to heaven by our own good works, then what was the purpose of Jesus dying? He didn't need to die if we could get there on our own. No, he died because he knew that we needed him. He died because he knew that there was no way for us to make it there without him. Jesus, and, uh, Jesus Christ himself in John 14, 6 tells us, you know, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, I'll be very candid with you this morning. You know, I'm very clear. Muhammad can't get you there. Buddha can't get you there. You know, there is no other faith that could get you there. There is only one individual that can get you to heaven. It's Jesus Christ. Broad, the Bible says, broad is the path to destruction. Narrow is the way. Under, under that eternal life. Under that, 
that righteousness that we're seeking after. You know, no matter how hard man tries, he cannot bring peace and contentment to his own soul apart from trusting Christ as his Savior. He's our only hope. He's the only hope for this world. He's the only hope for our salvation. Number five and last, his deliverance. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, last passage I'll have you look at. A couple more passages of scripture I'm going to reference here. Hebrews chapter 4, number 5 and last, his deliverance. Verses 8 and 9 of John chapter 5. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on that same day was the Sabbath. Number 5 and last, his deliverance. Just like this man needed Christ, just, so that, just like this man needed healing, so does the world. This man was delivered from his condition through Jesus' providential healing. The world has been provided deliverance from its plight of sin through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, God wants us to come boldly before him and ask him for what we need. You know, what did this lame man need? Healing. He needed healing. He needed someone to help him. You know, ultimately, at the very beginning, he didn't understand who was standing right next to him. He didn't understand that God incarnate, God in flesh, was standing right next to him, provided that healing. We see that later on in the passage, Jesus goes and finds him again and explains to him who he was. But at the very beginning, he didn't. He just needed someone to help him. You know, God wants us to go before him boldly, boldly, and ask him for those things that we need. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 through 15 explains to us, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I asked an individual one time, I go, uh, did you, did you know that the Bible explains to us that we can't have eternal life? And they said, well, I've never seen that before. And I, I took them to 1 John chapter 5 where it says, you know, in this verse that we just read, these things I've written unto you. He wrote these things right in the Bible so that we could understand this. Those that believe on the name of the Son of God, those that believe that Jesus Christ really is who he said he was, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Not maybe have, but that you know you have it. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we will have the petitions that we desired of him. You know, God wants us to be delivered. If God didn't want us to be in heaven with him someday, he wouldn't have provided deliverance through his son. He wouldn't have bothered to come from heaven to earth in the form of a man, and died on that cross, went through all that agony, unrecognizable by mankind after he was beaten within an inch of his life and ultimately put to death. Why bother? You know, if you were God, why would we bother to die for someone that we created? You know, that's something that still boggles my mind a little bit, but at the very least, we know that God showed the ultimate form of love by doing so. He came from heaven to earth to deliver man from his plight of sin. To be able to have man to have victory over that sin. And at the same time to be able to have heaven someday to be with him. God provided it. He did the hard work. All he expects us to do is believe. Believe and ask. And God will answer those. That word petition means uh, uh, requests being made to him. God says if you believe it, if you believe that Jesus Christ really is who he said he was, and you know that you need that salvation, if you were to come to me and ask, I'll hear it. I'll answer that prayer. In conclusion this morning, those that are here today that have never trusted Jesus Christ to save you from your sin so that one day heaven can be your home, would you be willing to take that little bit of faith this morning and just ask him? Stop trusting in yourself to get yourself to heaven because it doesn't matter how hard you try, it's impossible to get there on your own. There's not enough good that you can do to outweigh the bad in your life. There's not enough. It's not acceptable. The only, sac the only acceptable sacrifice to God was his son's payment. That was the whole purpose of his son coming. He expects you to trust in him. Those that are saved, let me ask you, do you hear the cries of the crippled world around us seeking healing 
seeking redemption? Do we hear them or have we become numb? Numb to their cries. Who are you willing to help get to the Lord? Who are you willing to leave your comfort zone and carry to the pool of Bethesda, spiritually speaking? Is there anyone that you would look at and say, you know what? Not today. Is there anyone that you would look at and say, you know what? That's an inconvenience to me. I don't think I can. I don't want to do that, Lord. Someone else will help them. You know, we try to alleviate our guilt. We try to alleviate the, uh, uh, the, the leadings of God in our life to, uh, to not do what God wants us to do. Will you help? Let's make the difference and help those that need to be led to the Savior. Just like this lame man needed God, so do we. There's some people in here this morning that you may need some physical healing. You know, God has the capability of doing that if it's his will. But ultimately, with life being so short, you know, ultimately God wants you to have that one thing that many in this world are missing, that acceptance of Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that gift of eternal life he wants to give to you today. Would you be willing to ask? We'll, be able, we'll take, that, take care of that here in a minute if you'd like. But let's make sure that we're listening to God this morning. Let's make sure we make the decisions that God tells us to make. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to have good Bible illustrations that apply to us even today. Lord, this lame man needed physical healing in his life. Lord, and, and the entire world needs spiritual healing. Lord, our, our, our world is so torn up, so messed up grasping at straws uh, in, in any way, shape, or form to take care of the, the hurt in their lives in whatever shape, way, shape, or form that they can. Father, what they need is for Christians, those that are believers, those that know of the hope that is within them, to go to others and explain to them, hey, this could be obtained by you as well. This is the answer. This can help bring you out and help you to have victory. This can't help you to be able to, to, to be in heaven someday with Christ. Father, I pray that if there's someone here this morning that has never put their trust 100% in Jesus Christ as their, their way to heaven through salvation, Lord, help them, Lord, to make that decision this morning. Lord, I know that you want them to make that decision. Lord, I know that you care enough about them. Lord, to give them the opportunity to see from your word that it's not their good right, their righteousness that gets them to heaven. It's the righteousness of Christ that gets them there. Christ's willingness to die a perfect sacrifice so that they could get to heaven someday through him. Lord, help them to make that decision. Lord, for those of us that have already accepted your son as Savior, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to make the decision this morning. Lord, to help those that are in this dying world. To, to answer their call, their cry for help in any way, shape, or form that we possibly can. Whatever we can do, Lord, help us to make the difference. Lord, and we'll give you the praise and glory and honor for everything that you do. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.